We'll be like on a two minute delay, but I just want people to. Hello. Are we all here? Looks like I'm it. Here. Yeah, I think so, like. yeah. All right. I can call this meeting to order then. Uh, do we have both council members, um, Liam and Wahab, on the, on the line? Yep. Yes, I see. Okay. Yep. Uh, I see you. Okay. Let the record reflect all of us, all the members of the committee are here. Are there any public, <laughs> are there any public comments? Is there any, yeah, member of the, okay. Um, so see. We only, uh, Mayor Halliday, there was only um, written comments, public comments expect, except, accepted for this meeting. Um, so there was one letter that was received, I think hopefully got emailed out to the committee. Um, I'm not sure if it got, it, did Chrissy email it out, Dustin? I, I believe so. I believe it went out in the last hour. Um, we just oh, received okay. it. Oh, okay. might not have seen it in the last this hour. Afternoon. Um, let's look for it. Uh, is it? Um, from, from Chrissy Mello. Look for that in your email. Yeah, so that is agenda, agenda item. That's agenda item three, so should we wait until then? Yes, that's fine. Okay, so um, we have approval of the minutes of May 20th. So moved. Mm -hmm. Second. Uh, all right, uh, all in favor, I don't Aye. see anyone opposed to approval of the minutes? No? Okay. Um, the minutes um, from uh, May 20th are approved. We're going to move on to item number two, which is review of proposed fiscal year 2021 Public Works and Utilities Department organizational changes. Uh, just going to take this. Um, I, I I can go ahead and jump in here, Mayor, if you'd like. Okay. Um, so what we put forward, and I won't I won't hash through each of the uh, <laughs> each of the positions or the reasoning behind it um, necessarily, but uh, can answer questions. Um, you know, after getting through the the uh, budget ad adoption um, and sort of uh, reassessing uh, or assessing where the uh, where we ended up um, discussing with uh, Public Works Director Mary, we we noticed that there were a few positions um, that really needed to. To be included um, that were not included in uh, what was proposed and then adopted by council um, so that they could uh, really perform some some very important functions allow them to continue to operate um, in a both safe and strategic manner um, and uh, operate in a way that addresses some of uh, some of council's priorities um, to that end we're looking at adding um, uh, three and a half positions um, in the uh, utilities area of the city um, so that we can uh, continue to provide excellent service to the community um, and uh, continue to um, operate in a way that will allow us to address the uh, needs of the community uh, the, that council feels are most important. Um, that's really kind of all I've got. Uh, looking to get the committees um, uh, feedback on that, and if it is supported by the committee, then asking that the committee refer this to council uh, for their approval uh, and re review and, and potential approval um, in September. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Are there any questions from committee members? Um, why, sorry. why did we not include it? I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, um, it's okay. Go ahead. I, I just want to understand clearly why we didn't include it. And, you know, within a month, we're including it pretty much. Right. So it, essentially it was partially missed. Um, 
in the the proposal um, as you all are very aware we went uh through a very um <laughs> in some ways drawn out and in other ways very abbreviated process um some of which uh you know essentially um Kelly and I had to make some decisions uh, without uh, uh, being able to go back and check each and every one of those decisions um, with the department heads. Uh, this was one that, um, w you know, nearly the day after it was adopted, um, Director Emery approached me and said, uh, I thought this was in there. The conversation went like, no, it's not. Um, uh, he was upset because, you know, these did not have a general fund impact, um, yet the decision was made to exclude them. Um, that's sort of why um, I bring them back to council humbly, or the committee humbly. Um, should I, if they had had a, a general fund impact, I would have um, obviously told him that now is not the time and we would not be bringing this back to a committee now and then to the council uh, in, in September should it have been, um, should it be supported. All right. Any any other do you have a, any other questions, Aisha? So okay, so no impact to the general fund, which was in the staff report, and you know I, I hesitate to to move this forward just because of the fact that we we did talk about the budget. There there are some concerns, obviously, as we move forward as well. Um, but I have no other questions. Thank you. All right, thanks, Sarah. Thank you. So, um, you know, I appreciate that this is not a general fund impact. However, we did ask for um, COLA re reductions or, you know, employee savings based on uh, agnostic of the um, fund. And so it feels um, inconsistent to um, approve, um, approve additional positions. You know, the changing positions, even though there's a cost to that, I can kind of wrap my head around, but the ones that are straight ads, I'm having real difficulty with. So, you know, speak to that. I can, sure. You know, the ones that are ads are, um, are being added uh, specifically to uh, address council priorities. Um, and so, you know, if they, if they're not added, um, that means you know, essentially, we may not be able to um, to do some of the work that that council is hoping for in the near term. I think that's um, going to be true regardless in a lot of areas. I think um, you know none of us are are thrilled about that, but we understand that um, with the impacts of COVID-19 on on both the organization, the economy, the community, um, the country at large, um, you know we understand that there may be some adjusting of priorities. Um, maybe not the priorities specifically, but in the um, sort of deliverable timeline. Um, so if that's the case, um, you know. I think Director Mary will understand, um, and you know the the others are, are being added specifically for sort of um, the ability to address uh, current needs um, in the organization and in the community. Yeah, and I I don't have any qualms about the justification for the um, for the positions. You know, it's a very one well uh, well run department. Um, the asks that come out of that department are very well reasoned. I trust you know you, Dustin and Kelly um, and Maria in terms of vetting these things. So our process is fine and our um, you know service is exemplary. What what is what I'm feeling like I can't support is going back on the everything has to cut agnostic of department. And so if that then means um, Council has to reconsider what our priorities are or what our timelines are. Then that's our role in that. And so I guess that would be my recommendation: is you know to the extent that it makes sense to remodify an existing position, okay, we pretty much do that regularly. And there were some of those in the budget, so that feels consistent. Anything else that has, um, you know, is just a complete add, and therefore we need to rethink priorities or expectations. If that makes sense. Okay. Um, so I, I want to ask about, you know, going back, I mean, we have now fully switched to the automated meter, metering system. 
And and I know I have asked this before, and I believe I was told that now we have to we have to do it differently, and so we have to read the meters. And there was still, I mean, did we have a did did we not have a reduction in the need for meter reading positions when we switched to the new system? We, we certainly did, and we have reduced um, the number of meter readers that we have. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't a need. Essentially, their, their function um, changed. It morphed a bit because we, we still do have equipment that they're going out and servicing. They do break. Um, you know, they are going out, and, and when we have problems, they've got to go out and read and, and verify certain things, uh, you know, that the numbers are, are being read correct, or if they're not, fixing the problem and making sure that we adjust folks' bills. Um, so it, there there is still a function that they're performing. It, it's just they're not simply going around reading, recording, and then billing in the same ways that they used to. And if I may add, uh, Mayor, um, you might have seen it in the staff report, but Alex did um, evaluate which positions that he currently had that he no longer needed, and in the proposed position deletion. There is a half a meter, meter reader. I, I did notice that, yes. But yeah. I'm just, so we still have, so how many do we have? And it's just that I have trouble understanding how if we were going out and inspecting, you know, all of the meters every I don't know. I think it is not every month. It's quarterly, or right? Is that correct? Was it billed quarterly? I believe it used or to be bi monthly. It's every bi other month. Yeah, yeah correct. Yeah. Or yeah. Um, so um, so that that we now still have work for all those people who are doing that, or have still had work in doing this other like, and now we're losing a half of one. <laughs> um. It's, I just, I honestly, I don't understand this. However, what I do understand is that water, that providing water service to people is one of the most important things that we do. Um, and probably less important than water, wastewater treatment service, but, and not as extensive, but it is still, it is still very, very important. And, um, and, uh, you know, and it is a well-run department, and it is, it is a um, an enterprise department that you know. Uh, so, so the money is the money there in the enterprise fund to uh, support these positions, the these additional positions. It is, and um, you know, we're not. We have, uh, you know, as as you all know, we are looking to um, freeze uh, rates uh, where they're at, so that we can um, offer uh, the community a, a break during all of this, um, avoiding you know increases in fees and things like that, so that we can, um, you know, not hurt people that are already hurting any more than they already are. Um, and so, yes, the fund uh, can support it. Um, essentially, if, if it's not something that the committee supports, then we understand. Um, but I mean, we did we did raise rates. We have raised rates re recently, um, largely because of the increased cost of, wa of the water right. we're getting. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a hard time not recommending it because I, I, this is, and and some of them are tied to our conservation efforts, our ability to deliver the um, to to deliver the uh, recycled water that we're now uh, giving, and I I am fully aware of the um, the increased regulatory requirements and the need to meet them and the need to document that. So um, I. You know, I, I, I am ready to support passing this on to council, and we may get similar questions there. I mean, I think the questions certainly are, are warranted, though, that um, uh, one of mine was, will we have difficulty, again, recruiting for the new water resources position? That is because apparently we didn't fill that before because we had trouble recommending it. 
You know, I think that's a fantastic point, and I think the uh, the answer, quite honestly, is yes. And that's part of the reason we're here um, is so that we can begin recruitment for uh, for the positions that we know are hard to fill, um, <laughs> with the hopes that we'll get them filled uh, in the last quarter of the calendar year, um, but no sooner. And you know, in all likelihood, there's always potential that it could go even longer than that. However, we don't want to go out uh, and recruit for a position that we don't have included in the budget, um, find a, a great candidate and, um, you know, not be able to bring them into the organization. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, another reason uh, that we're, we're approaching the committee now um, in the hopes that we can, um, you know, sort of replenish. We, we, we've seen a lot of um, talent walk out of the walk out of the organization um, because, you know, quite frankly, quite quite frankly, there are districts that pay a whole lot more money than we do, um, and so we tend to lose uh, some of our most talented folks um, to those higher paid positions. Um, so we're we're trying to create, um, you know, with some of this, some more natural path. Uh, growth path inside of the organization so that they don't have to leave um, to either get promoted or or, or get an increase. Um, and so, you know, do I expect that it'll be difficult to recruit? Yeah, potentially. Um, we are in a, a bit different environment where we know there will be probably some more people looking towards the government for uh, employment um, with some of the for-profit uh, industries hurting and, and, you know, that sort of thing. But um, I can't say definitively yes or no on that, but my, my gut tells me probably we'd have some difficulty recruiting in, in the same similar ways that we have in the past. And um, I know all of these, the, the th whatever it was, three positions, the ones that are being eliminated um, are, are now vacant, but they are in, included in the budget, although we're having savings right now and ha not having them filled and probably have been, correct? Correct. So anyway, I, I, I all right. I, I mean, I I would be inclined to recommend moving this forward to the, um, you know, to the full council with a you know appro a approval. But I think that that's not where my two colleagues are. Am I? Are we still uh, correct? I'll make a motion to <laughs> approve the staff recommendation. Is there a second? I'm not hearing one. <laughs> so, <laughs> does someone else want to make another motion? Sure. I'll move that um, that a recommendation can come to council that works within the existing positions and makes adjustments recognizing that and also um, provides feedback if there are adjustments um, to priorities or deliverables that need to adjust um, reflective of that um, and certainly, you know, open to revisiting this in the next budget cycle. Yeah, so that's the, the reclassifications or upgrades right. of the positions. Your, that would be the recommendation to move forward with those, but not the new position ads. And to go ahead and recruit for the ones that, you know, within replacing positions that are vacant. Mm -hmm. May I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Um, are we asking for potential options? So, for example, if if an adjustment were to be made that, you know, the staff report, let's say if we move forward with this um, motion that in the staff report coming to council, there would be an option saying that, hey, if we were to include these, these are the priorities that we would shift. If we were to go with plan B, these are, so I just want to make sure that, you know, I, I personally would like to see the full picture and the impact. Um, with and without so with just um in line with the employees um that are currently available and then possibly a plan b with um you know the current employees to add and delete and impacts if if, if that makes sense right so like with the full can, picture so then the full council can decide we I can think do that. May, i'm not sure it fully makes sense to me right now but uh, but i think no, I, 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 get what you're, I think i get what you're getting at and that and yes that that certainly can be included in the motion that that coming forward to council it include that kind of analysis of i think uh, what we would do is take the strategic roadmap and identify which projects might be delayed or deferred because of the the not adding positions is what i'm understanding or other projects that might get delayed that aren't in the strategic roadmap Okay, I, I would be supportive 
of at least understanding full picture the impact uh, pros and cons for each uh, plan if, if the motioner is okay with that. Yeah, certainly. I'm um, having um, All right. Yeah, that's fine. Thank All you. All right. With that, do you, and Steph, do you think you understand that the way, you know, I think she really, she just wants it to, it will come back to council, I assume, um, with a, a fuller analysis of each position, the need for it, and what happens without, and uh, with the accompanying financial analysis, too, of where we would stand. Um, all right, I, 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 that I, that's pretty clear clear to me, and um, so I uh, so I will support uh, support that motion as well. Did you second it, Aisha? Did you go ahead and do that? Yes. Okay. So I, I will support that motion, and you can carry this forward with that recommendation from um, the budget committee that we had concerns about increases in the budget, and we asked that it come back to council in this manner for final determination. We'll make sure that that's included in the staff report and then also the uh, discussion in September. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Now uh, we're going to move on to item number three, which is um, uh, review and discuss public safety community survey policy topics. And um, here's where, uh, and I'll just go ahead and read it before. Um, well, I guess we could. I don't know. We don't. We hardly ever have. I'm going to go ahead and read this. Kind yeah, of I mean, I know we don't normally, but it also came in before. I think any. I mean, I know I didn't have a chance to read it. It sounds like you didn't have a chance to read it, so we might as well read it. Okay, it's not that long. It's, it's just. Um, okay. Uh, to the Budget Committee. We are writing on behalf of the Hayward Community Coalition, a collective of over 60 community members, not the same 30 people. The voices you hear are the voices who speak for our loved ones, who stay at home to care for families. We speak for essential workers working night shifts to make ends meet. We speak for those who simply cannot refuse to partake in a system that has routinely shut them out. The stories you hear of fear and injustice are the stories of a community who is too often overlooked. As a community, we are concerned about the decision to bring in an outside consultant uh, to do what? We ask that you consult with us, the community, your community, not an outside consultant who views the heart of the Bay as figures and numbers. The residents who have direct interactions with law enforcement know best how to allocate money to make our community and school safe. We ask that you listen to the voices of the community who call into city council meetings pleading to defund the police, listen to the voices chanting in our streets to abolish the police, listen to the stories of students who have felt intimidated by the SROs on their campuses. Um, no outside consulting firm can make an assessment that speaks to these lived experiences. When we ask that 10% of the police budget be reallocated to fund other needed community services, such as counselors, mental health first teams, therapists, and other services that help the community. Okay, that's okay. Well, in regards to the 10% we feel are being generous, not being generous. We have seen neighboring cities like San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, San Leandro, and more take swift action in response to the calls of the community. Some of these cities are committing to redirecting up to 50% of their police budget. Too much money is going toward funding a system that continues to terrorize our black and brown community while simultaneously depriving them of basic needs and other forms of safety precautions. The police do not keep us safe. The police do not prevent crime. Investing in community services and opportunities will help prevent crime. The police act as undertrained first responders to situations that should be addressed by professionals well-versed in practices to de-escalate situations that include mental health crises, domestic violence, homelessness, and subject to substance abuse. Investing in these professionals is an investment in the actual safety and well-being of the community you have been elected to represent. For nearly two months now, the Hayward community has organized several marches and rallies to speak out against police brutality, racism, and injustice. The community is calling for justice for Augie Gonzalez, Nate Greer, Roy Nelson, Steny Ramirez, and those who um, before them 
whose lives were taken too soon at the hands of Hayward police. We feel that the city council has brushed aside brushed us aside in response. The community came together in front of Mayor Halliday's house to ensure she listened to our demands to defund the police. History shows that Hayward is not uh, immune to the issues of police brutality, misconduct, and racism. You've seen the reports and recordings, and you have been complicit in the injustice. The community will no longer be idle or compliant with injustices that members of our community continue to endure. The Hayward community knows what is best for us. Consult with us to make budget and policing decisions. We are the ones who bear the burden of their mistreatment. We ask that you establish a citywide participatory committee for all residents to have input on how to reallocate the 10% of the police budget to non-police community-based services in community in solidarity from the Hayward Community Coalition. Okay, not everything. Oh, okay. That's that's the public comment. So now um, I'll, rem I'll move on to ask for the staff presentation. Thank you, Mayor. I think I will kick this off. And we have a number of staff members um, who are here to participate with us in this conversation. Um, I wanted to just uh, reiterate um, from the, the the July 21st work session, the purposes of the community engagement framework that we presented to council. And that is to listen and respond to community member concerns about policing and public safety in Hayward, and in particular, the way in which city policies and practices may be disproportionately impacting community color, communities of color in Hayward. We wanna have a broader conversation on public safety issues to create a shared understanding of what public safety means for the Hayward community, and to begin to brainstorm some potential policy options for realizing that vision. We want to cultivate and strengthen critical relationships between community members, the community advisory panel, the police department, and other city staff. And we want to relay information to council about community priorities for public safety identified during the engagement process, experiences shared relating to policing in Hayward, and recommendations and policy options identified centered around racial equity to achieve public safety for all Hayward community members. And I just, uh, to that end, really we had focused on, I think, two elements of um, of the plan that were sort of crucial to, to um, sort of the core of that plan. One is the sort of quantitative data analysis, and that is um, a survey that would be, um, you know, scientifically conducted um, to give us a, a more broader view of um, general perceptions across the community about public safety, about policing. And then the second piece would be the more qualitative piece, which is a lot of what I think um, you're hearing in the letters and the public comments, which is the stories, the the trauma, the hurt, the anger that ha that some members of our community feel and have experienced and and want to express to the city council. And so that's why we've coupled the this the survey with the community conversations so that we have a narrative to go along. Um, and to and and have statistics also, so we can hopefully match those two up and and figure out. I mean, the the purpose of this the statistical study is to determine if there are particular neighborhoods or areas of the city that are receiving or feeling disproportional impacts um, from policing services. If there are certain demographic groups that are experiencing disproportional impacts, and then that also helps us more uh, be more focused in the community conversations that we're having so that we can dive deeper and understand and have those community conversations with those groups with those neighborhoods to understand what those concerns are and so really trying to create a, a package um, that that helps us present a more fuller picture to the council about the community's needs and desires and so um, what we wanted to do we did hear from I, I believe at least four council members during that work session a desire to move forward with the survey in some way. Um, we did hear some concerns with um, some of the proposals that were in that initial uh, the staff report. Um, we have we have uh, asked Dave Metz and Miranda Everett, who are um, with FM3, to join us today. So they'll be here to listen to the, the committee's conversation, um, also to hear feedback. And one of the key pieces we heard was uh, this: the focus group that, or the this online focus uh, discussion board that FM3 was going to facilitate. That there was concern, you know, why do we need a consultant to facilitate the focus group? We also heard a concern about having 
some additional expertise brought into their team that may have um, more experience in policing, racial equity issues, um, you know, and some of the institutional and systemic racism and bias issues that we're trying to, to dive into. So in talking with FM3, we are proposing to modify their scope of work to basically eliminate that front end focus group conversation um, and, and bring on, um, they will bring on a sub consultant that will specifically be focused in um, a practice of understanding uh, racial equity issues, policing issues, and have more of that, that experience. Um, they, we've been working with two, um, two consulting firms that could serve as subcontractors. We're trying to work out the details of that a little bit more, um, but I can I will let the council know once that is finalized. Um, one of them is based out of Oakland. Another is a sole proprietor who um, is in doing, originally from the Bay Area, but doing some um, additional work in Los Angeles right now and so but has grounding and, and grew up in the Bay Area so um, both of those firms I think would provide some of that context that I think the that I heard from the council that was missing um, from from that discussion the other night um, what we really wanted to do tonight was to let the committee do a, a preliminary sort of deeper dive into what some of the policy issues might be might be for this survey. What questions do you want to ask um, in the survey? And and really, this is the first conversation. We, I know we added um, as attachments to the staff report the letter from the community services commissions with a number of their recommendations, um, the original um, seven demands letter from the community coalition. Um, I know there's a lot of other sort of policy topics that are out there uh, floating around. So I think what we wanted to do is really let the committee. Um, brainstorm around those policy issues and areas, um, if there are specific topics that you want to make sure that are covered in the survey, and then also to allow you to ask questions of Dave and Miranda about, I know there are some concerns about methodology and um, particularly from Councilmember Rohab during the work session. So, you know, can talk more a little bit about why you know certain methodologies are used when we're doing a, a survey. Um, and I do want to emphasize that the survey is for all residents. It is not just for registered voters. I know we've used FM3 before um, for, uh, you know, for po uh, polling data for ballot measures, but they also do resident satisfaction surveys. This is a, a methodology, and I think there was a the question of why are we hiring a consultant? It's because we want to have more um, sort of scientifically based data to be able to dive deeper into these issues. So I'm going to stop uh, talking there and um, we're happy I think Dave and Miranda can turn their turn their cameras on at some point and you can you can meet them, say hello to them. Um, there's Dave. <laughs> and then uh, uh, we're happy to uh, answer any questions, um, just hear from the committee about um, how you want to move for move through this discussion and, and topics that you might want to cover in the survey. Okay. okay. So that's, that's your, your, uh -oh. I'm getting a little echo there. Um, so you're now you're opening up for our, our questions. Um, we're not going to have a presentation. Okay. So um, so who would like to go first? Okay. Do we have any questions? Sure. Wow, I had a few. I do have questions. Or, or, Go ahead. So we're not getting the. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, we're not getting the list of questions um, today, right? We're not getting a presentation no, no. or anything. This, so this is the first step. And then what the what we're planning to do is I, I think Dave and Miranda will take copious notes uh, from this conversation, put together, and then we'll also be talking with other stakeholder groups, getting feedback and input into the survey questionnaire. And then I think what I would propose to do is send that question out to council members um, via email, and because we will be in the August recess, and then I'm happy to have follow up conversations with council members to walk through that. Um, it, I think that will still fit us within our time frame um, and uh, to, to conduct the survey on the original timeline that we were working on. Okay. Um, so my my question is, and, and for anybody listening um, uh, to do any type of survey or anything, the first conversation we had, I, I want to say on the 21st um, regarding all this, I, I want to understand from you, what was your perspective in 
as you always state, uh, direction from council, specifically as I've raised many points, but because, um, you know, colleagues haven't chimed in after I spoke. So I, I kind of want to understand out of the many different points that I actually suggested, um, and I know our mayor spoke after me, but, um, you know, some of the items I brought didn't necessarily with the four nods. So I just want to understand clearly on this particular issue, um, what is it that you included, adjusted, changed? So I understand that we are potentially getting a subcontractor. Correct. Um, that, this, this that was, in, I think, direct response to, I think you had mentioned a concern about having someone with some of that more specialized expertise. I think Council Member Salinas had talked about potentially leveraging some of the faculty at the, the universities. I think a couple other council members had also expressed, you know, an interest in having that partnership. Are we increasing the number of people participating from from that 400 to hopefully 5% or something closer? So I'm going to let Dave actually answer that question about why why the 400. We will probably increase it to maybe 500, um, but there is there is a magic in statistics to that number. Um, so Dave, you are the statistics guru. So if you want to talk a little bit more about why why that number, and I think five just frankly interviewing five or surveying 5% of the community would be cost prohibited. I mean, it would cost us, you know, several hundred thousand dollars to do that. Um, so that's what, but let, we can talk more about the methodology. So why don't you, Dave, go ahead and do that. Sure. Um, so in doing surveys, the sort of the underlying principle is that if you take a randomly selected sample from a large population, uh, the size of that sample will determine the margin of error for the survey, but the size of the underlying population uh, doesn't really affect its accuracy. So for example, if we do a survey of 800 people in the city of Hayward, it'll have a margin of error of plus or minus 3.1%. If we do a sample of 800 people in the United States, it will also have a margin of error of 3.1%. And each will speak to the broader population from which it was drawn with the same degree of accuracy. Um, the key is that the sample be random, that the participants be selected randomly, and that all residents of the city have an equal uh, percentage chance of being selected to participate. And as long as that condition is met, statistically, samples of a few hundred people can speak to the uh, opinions of the broader population with that um, statistical precision. Okay. And then I want to understand, are the subcontractors, um, one, I, I would eventually like to know who the names are um, and, and eventually, you know, how they were selected, specifically if we did not do an RFP, which I do not believe we did on this, right? Um, so I, I'd like to see that. I'd also like to see the number of researchers that are specifically people of color and, and you know, have lived experiences and so forth, their education background and, and so forth. Um, and then at the same time, when we, uh, you know, you referenced the community coalition, uh, the collective's original seven demands. Um, these are moving pieces as well, because I think the seven demands got whittled down to about four um, and, you know, how will the engagement be with those specific groups? I, I also, I know I'm also interested in the engagement with uh, SEIU because, um, you know, when we talk about cuts and stuff, it's usually to not the focus, right? Um, so I, I don't want them to be impacted. And then um, uh, I want the police to also have their own um you know, internal assessment of what they believe they can they can do. They they'd like to see change, um, and that's not only like in their career, but then also in their department and how they service the community. So, uh, a real deep dive with them um, because I think that their voice is important as it impacts them as well. Um, so, so that's at least my two cents on it. Um, I'll refrain until I hear from others or something pops up. Why don't I'll just talk so. Um, we, we've explored the two sub consultants um, because of the size of the contract. It can be a more informal bidding process. It doesn't have to be a formal request for proposals. Um, I know uh, Laurel has been um, reaching out to the Urban Strategies Council in Oakland, um, which I believe is a um, uh, minority-owned business. Uh, Laurel, do you want to speak more to the Urban Strategies Council, and then Dave can speak about the other. Uh, woman that we were work that we're, we may work with. I don't know, Laura, if you can hear me. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Um, 
You may be already familiar with the Urban Strategies Council. It's a regional research and advocacy organization dedicated to racial, social, and economic equity. Um, and they have worked w as consultants with governments, with nonprofits, um, with other agencies and entities before doing uh, social research um, and uh, data analysis around issues that have to do with racial equity, criminal justice reform, um, economic opportunity, and violence prevention. And they've been around working in Oakland and the East Bay for more than 32 years. And then, Dave, do you want to talk about the other firm? Oh, sure. I, 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 sorry, sorry. Before you begin, I do want to say that I, I granted, you know, the firms that do the work is one thing. Um, information or getting a second opinion and, um, you know, you, you can discuss cost or so forth. But the Ella Baker Center, as well as Urban Habitat, I think are two um, organizations that would potentially like to chime in if we are trying to be as, as thorough as possible. They, they are local Oakland-ish, right? So um, uh, I, I would like, I, I'm sure that people could even potentially pro bono. Um, there are a lot of uh, policymakers and so forth that are involved in that. So just tossing that out, but um, go ahead. Yeah, we can, there, we can definitely. We can definitely. I heard the Ella Baker Center, Sorry. what was the second one? Um, yeah. Urban Habitat. Thank you. What was the other one? Ella Urban Baker Habitat. Center. And, sorry. Go ahead. I didn't hear it. Ella Baker urban Center Habitat and, and Urban 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 Habitat <laughs> and Ella Baker Baker Center. Oh, oh, I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, and then Dave was going to talk about uh, the other the other firm that we've been having conversations with. Yeah. Uh, so we've also talked with Shikari Byerly, who runs a public opinion research company called Avidaris. They're based down in Los Angeles. Uh, she's a former colleague of ours who worked for us for a number of years um, before going down to LA to go to UCLA and get her PhD in political science. And while there, she's been stu studying primarily uh, the relationship between race and ethnicity and public policy. And much of the work that she has done as a pollster has focused on those issues specifically. Um, and as uh, Kelly noted earlier, she was based up here in Northern California for years uh, in Oakland and uh, is familiar with uh, the community as well. So we thought she might be a good fit. The other thing I would note is that while uh, from a contracting perspective, uh, this person might be a subconsultant, certainly because of Shikari's expertise in public opinion research, we would view it more as a partnership where we would work together in all elements of uh, designing the survey's methodology, uh, writing the questionnaires, gathering feedback from the city, your partners and other stakeholders and revising it, and then analyzing and presenting the results. So it would be a, it would be sort of a team approach. And I think we can also reach out to the the organizations that you had mentioned, mentioned Councilmember Wahab, and see how they might also provide some input or feedback into the work that we're we're working on, and um, if there's some additional um, advice or um, sort of policy guidance they may provide. So I think that those are great suggestions. We're, we'll look into those as uh, well. Just to also add, um, when we talk about Cal State East Bay professors. There's two professors on the top of my head that um, I think are um, local as well. Um, you know, women, women of color, um, background in political science, as well as a PhD in uh, ethnic studies. Um, so I think that I'm happy to forward their contact as well. I think that they would, um, you know, chime in, if you will. I think all of these groups would be very beneficial in sort of review of the survey questionnaire and kind of looking at it from that lens, um, you know, once once we've got sort of a, dra a rough draft. And I think there'll be some a lot of folks that will vet that and look through that. So, yeah, that would be great if you could send those contacts along to us. Okay. Anything else, Aisha? Um, no, I'll, I'll chime in if I hear something. Okay. Um, okay, Sarah. Sure. So thank you. Um, I appreciate the, the report and the response. And I do both. Um, so let me just talk through kind of the contract and the funds, just to make sure I understand. Um, 
what the plan is. Um, and I know you've said this, I'm just saying it back to make sure I understand it and can articulate it. So the idea is that um, a survey get created to help us do um, broad reach community, um, not community engagement, but um, community input, that that's both um, the dedicated phone survey for 500 people. And then is there also an online um, plan? I know for the community survey and some of the other ones we've done online. Dave, will there be an online questionnaire? Is this going to be mostly phone interviews this time? Uh, so the methodology we've designed will have three components to it. We're going to select a, a random sampling of residential addresses within the city of Hayward. Um, we will then gather whatever data we can about those addresses, contact information, including landline phones, wireless phones, and email addresses. We'll use all of those methods to reach out to a randomly selected member of each of those households. And then for those households where we are unable to obtain other contact information, we'll send them postcards uh, with an invitation to participate in the CERP. So the idea is to try to be as diverse as possible in our mechanisms of outreach so that for each randomly sampled address, we have as many opportunities as possible for the members of that household to participate. That's all good. Um, and <laughs> so I understand that and I understand why that is, um, that there's some um, framework around that to make it um, statistically sound and um, that the methodology works with that. In the past, for some surveys, we've also had um, a data set that was strictly an online survey. Um, it wasn't, the two data sets were um, disaggregated so that it was clear that one was the methodology and the other was, you know, whoever happened to respond in the way that they happened to respond. And no, we don't have a way to necessarily know if it wasn't the same person multiple times, but it was a little bit broader for anybody who said, hey, I didn't get that phone call, but I really have something I want to say. Um, so is there a thought of doing that this time? Yes, absolutely. And that's that's very easy to do. We can take the online survey questionnaire, provide the city with a link that will take people to the questionnaire and allow them to fill it out. Um, we can set it up so that essentially each individual computer can only respond once to avoid attempts to sort of multiply responses. Um, but then not only could the city essentially open the doors and say any member of the community who wants to take the survey is welcome to, but it also may be that there are certain uh, subgroups within the population whose voices we really want to make sure we hear, who we know are just bound to be represented in small numbers, even in a robust random sample survey. And if there are stakeholders or partners that can help us reach out to those communities and give them the survey to take it, we can gather all that data and, as you say, keep it separate from the random sample survey, but use it as a complement so that we've got multiple sort of uh, mechanisms of outreach to, to gather opinions on these questions. Fantastic. And obviously, translation will be important for, yes. for that as well. Fantastic. Um, I appreciate that. And um, so there's a, the data set. <laughs> then there's, I think as Kelly said, the, the community conversations piece. and. You know, even last night there was somebody that was identified that, at least in my opinion, would be great in that. I think um, my hope is that the folks from um, the collective and the community services commission, even the youth commission, um, and maybe some of the professors, both at um, Cal State and Chabot, um, can be leading those community conversations as they did, as was done with the task force. Um, am I thinking right that that is part of the plan? Absolutely. Yes. Great. And I think Mary Thomas is on uh, on here as well. Maybe she can talk a little bit about some of that outreach work. We've already started working with the Chabot students this summer to start vetting some of the discussion questions for those community conversations. So Mary, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So we um, we initially brainstormed some, some questions with both Chabot students as well as with some different staff, the Gare, Gare group of staff and um, with PD just to, to have something to start with because the summer classes end right now. <laughs> um, and the students have interviewed 200 uh, community members in Hayward using these questions and have used it for their writing assignments for the summer just to give us some initial baseline responses that we can share with FM3 um, and also for us to learn like what are the pitfalls of having students interview other students and what you know and what are the upsides. Um, but it's such it's been so successful that actually we have had 
five or six additional faculty um, want to sign on to do this in the fall. So we can probably interview hundreds of community members, members that way. Um, and then in addition, we'll have the community conversations that we've been talking about. Um, and so far, I have a list of at least 12 organizations that want to partner with that. But I'm super open to any referrals and will um, send out the draft working list. Um, the calendar for all of this should be up on the website by mid-August with the focus of doing it throughout the month of September. And I um, yeah, happy to um, help brainstorm around, especially like faith communities and some of the work on that process. Great, that would be and super think, helpful. Yeah, to the extent that council members have any suggestions about who we should be outreaching to, please send them. I'll make sure to share them with Mary and we can gather that information and, um, you know, brainstorming those lists would be very helpful for us. Absolutely, and it would seem we could also piggyback on the work of the census because this is mm. similar kind of, you know, who are those hard to count populations are probably the same populations that we would want to make sure. Um, yeah, that's a great, a a little, great idea. <laughs> little trouble hearing uh, Councilmember oh. Lamnon, but yeah, I hope you did. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know if that yes, helps I, what I heard was um, using the same. There's a, a, a large, I think, 28 organizations that have very. They're part of the census um, outreach, and so using some some of those same ones um, for sure. And I yeah. think help um, help any help reaching out and finding the right person at those organizations. I was super uh, super grateful for that. Um, the goal right now is to train using the GARE cohort because we have at least quite a few number of staff in those and anyone else who's interested to do a training with staff members to make sure that we have a wide range of staff who can help facilitate or be part of conversations so that um, we're spreading the wealth because we're hoping to do, you know, 40 or so. And so <laughs> making sure we can schedule it all in. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, and feel free to reach out if there's um, questions of, you know, who's the right contact for this or we, we can't find somebody in this population. You know, I think council, I'll volunteer us all um, to be a resource. Great. Thank that. you so much. I, I will. I will take you up on that. Good. Um, and so I appreciate the indulgence of my colleagues and being able to do this little bit deeper dive um, into what you're talking about that is really helpful. Um, specifically, the question you asked about questions, um, what I was thinking about was a few questions. So one is, um, what does a successful crisis response look like? And full disclaimer, not a, not a uh, researcher, not a pollster, not anything of, um, of value <laughs> other than a council member with questions in my head. So I'm going to say these. I trust that they get put into yeah, it. We will, we will, they will wordsmith them. They will take the, the concept and the idea and put it into right. survey uh, format. So, and, we'll, and then it will come back to you so you can, you can reflect on it. <laughs> that's right. Perfect. We want raw material here. Just things you think we should explore, questions you have in your mind. As Kelly says, we'll put it into survey shape later, but just want to make sure we hear your ideas. Perfect. That's exactly where I was coming from. So here's my raw ideas. Um, what does successful crisis response look like? And what does it not look like? Um, how much risk is acceptable for staff who are responding to, let's say, traffic issues or domestic issues? Um, you know, there is the proposal, just to quickly clarify this, um, you know, the idea that perhaps it's not um, an armed officer who does traffic enforcement or responds in a domestic violence or homelessness situation, okay, the underlying, the question that always comes next is what happens if that person gets hurt? And so I really like to understand from the community, what is their expectation about that? Um, you know, people in emergency rooms typically aren't armed, but deal with some of the same issues. And so how do we, how do we understand this issue of what is the right response and what is an acceptable level of risk to the person who's responding? Um, I think it would be helpful to know if people feel safe in this community. I think that's one of the questions we've asked in the past, and so another check-in on that. Um, I think we've also asked in the satisfaction survey about have they called 911 and how has been the response. I don't know that we need to duplicate that data, but in terms of the final response, uh, the final data set that comes to council, any data we already have that's applicable. Um, I know we only have so many questions on the questionnaire, so I don't want us to <laughs> duplicate anything we asked in 2019, um, but, but that's a data set that we can pull. Um, the other data set I think we can pull, and I know um, 
Kelly, you had staff do this as the nine, uh, the calls for service data. Um, and so um, to the extent that can be shared earlier with council members as we're having questions, conversations over the summer, um, and then obviously in this report as well. Yeah, I, I think the data on the calls for service did go to all council members. So okay. everyone, should, yeah, I think I copied all council when I responded to you with that data set, so. Fantastic, thank you. When was that? That, you, you... that was probably about a month and a half, two months ago now. Okay. Some, okay. Was, it some, was it that long ago? I can't remember. I say about a month. Maybe about a month ago. Yeah, I can I can resend it to council. Yeah, that that would be helpful. <laughs> We've gotten a lot of email in the past month and a half. <laughs> That's fair. Um, and then uh, two other two last ones. Um, so some police departments don't carry lethal force weapons or have an, a continuum of force. And what do people think would be the benefits or the drawbacks? of such an approach? What are their concerns about that or benefits? And the last one, um, similar to an earlier question of, and if, if there was a middle response, um, you know, on one end of the continuum, you have 211, which is an information, you know, what happens? I mean, you get information. 911, you get police or fire. And what if there was this middle response that was something else? Maybe it's a mental health professional, maybe it's um, a case manager, whatever maybe it's a nurse you know um what if there was this middle response and then who is it that decides that is it the disp dispatcher who decides that or is it the person on the call please send me a nurse um so how does that get triaged and this is the question um and what's the community expectation those are my questions thank you very much okay good um so I'm, I'm just going to start off by saying I hate surveys. You know, I hate taking them. I'm not sure I trust the data that you get out of them. One of my questions when I hear that, you know, 37 or, you know, 67% of the people think this, well, what did they know about that before they were asked about it is a question that I always have. So, um, so I, and then when I'm, when I'm taking a survey, it's like, well, I can't answer that in either yes or no, or on a scale of one to 10, because I want to know what, you know, well, what's the specific uh, situation? And, you know, well, what about this? <laughs> and, and so um, so I'll just put that out there, that that's my attitude towards surveys in general, and, and has been for a long time, since I was in graduate school in journalism, and that was longer ago than I want to say. So, um, uh, but I understand that we use surveys in our modern life, and, and, I, and I certainly, what we want, though, is we want to hear what people think in this community and what ideas they have, what their, you know, what their current view is of the way we provide police services, what they would like to see done differently, what they would like to see more of or less of, and, you know, I think we're, we're trying, that's what we're trying to get at. So one of my, my first question is, uh, is any of this going to be open-ended? Or you know where people will be able to is are you doing a survey that way rather than just pick one of these or tell me on a scale of one to ten? Yeah, um, there's I think we certainly envision there will absolutely have to be a, a, at least a few open-ended questions in the survey. Um, those kinds of questions are very time-consuming, so we can ask only a few of them if we're going to keep within the length of time we can really hold people's attention in the survey. Um, and I think, and the city manager can speak to this, the uh, the notion was that the companion research projects, which would be much more sort of longer, in-depth, and open-ended conversations would help to provide that context. Absolutely. And that might give us the open-ended and the, the quantitative survey would give us, like, maybe better discussion frames for those deeper conversations. So say, you really need to explore this issue because it kept coming up in the open-ended question, but we didn't really get to dive deeper into it. So you need to have additional conversations around X, Y, Z issue. Okay. And then, um, you know, and then are we going to be asking questions to at least, um, put this person in a, you know, what, what, what do they bring to the ta table? Or, or I mean, we're going to ask demographic questions or, um, uh, you know, uh, ge geographical questions about where they live or, you know, with the, do they work in Hayward? Um, those kinds of things to set, you know. Yeah, so, okay. And then, um, so I think, um, oh, and then how, 
do you have any thoughts on getting input for, I mean, our police deal frequently with people who are homeless. They don't have phones. Well, they, they do. A lot of times they do have phones, actually. So, I mean, do you do we think that we are going to be able to reach out to that population? Unsheltered. I'm sorry, council member. What? Uh, Landon. <laughs> um, uh, pop, people who are. <laughs> what? People who are homeless is the oh, okay. is my ask. <laughs> yeah. How are we going to reach out to people who are homeless, um, or or it has that been considered that we're going to try? And also, and I think this is really important because, you know, we know that mental health is a is a big part of this whole issue and how we deal with that. So how are we going to get at um, whether people have had any experience with, you know, police in connection with mental health issues and what they're, you know, and I think, you know, what you were, uh, I think it was, I, was it Aisha that, um, I'm sorry, I was thinking about something that, um, oh, well, no, that was different. But anyway, so, um, you know, that, that issue, how do we get that out? Like what, you know, so there, there need to be well-designed questions around that. Um, wh one thing Aisha brought up was, um, are we going to be surveying police, the police themselves in any way? Or, you know, how, how does their in input enter into this? So I think there's a couple of ways, and I'll just talk. I think it's more in the community conversation piece, along with SEIU and some of the other professional staff in the, in the police department. Um, but I do think there, that before... I've committed to both the command staff and the POA leadership um, an opportunity to review the survey questionnaire before it goes out so that they can have some input into it as well. Um, I think that would be important maybe with some of the shop stewards for SEIU because they've asked um, to be, I know they have a, a couple of shop stewards over there, um, so we can absolutely include those, those folks in the conversation. And I think then diving deeper in the community conversation, I, I see us having several internal conversations within the police department to that end, like what could be done differently? What policies or procedures are you concerned with? And, and those need to be obviously done delicately. And there may be some online survey that we could do of employees in that sense um, so that it could be more confidential and, and people could um, weigh in that way. So those are all things that we're exploring and trying to figure out the best approach. Okay. And how do you and, and then just really being careful about establishing the trust that would be needed for people to really open up in a, you know, in a situation like this. And specifically, uh, can I, to that, to that yeah. end, can I just make a point? Because I know um, Dr. Emily Young from Youth and Family Services Bureau has been on our working team, um, and she and Mary are working closely together to put together a resource list of um, therapists, counselors, um, if these conversations bring up uh, trauma for individuals who are participating, that we have resources to be able to direct folks to. Also, um, some of the YFSB counselors have asked to be facilitating some of the community conversations, so they will be part of uh, the staff team. They're very um, excited about participating in the process as well and, and look forward to being a part of it. So I think I just wanted, I know that that had come up about making sure that there's resources available for um, individuals who might um, have re relapses of trauma experiences. Um, I don't know that that's the right clinical term, but that, that experience when they go through a community conversation. Um, okay, and then um, I, I, on specific questions, uh, I think, um, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, obviously getting a sense of what kinds of interaction the survey, um, pers the pe person being surveyed has had with our police department um, and um, uh, and then it was specific things like, and one of the interests sort of, well, uh, something that has intrigued me from the um, seven demands is the participatory budget um, idea. But, you know, if you say, well, what do you think of participatory budgeting? I think most people would say, what is it? So things like that, like, how do you, I, I, I think that you know, um, if we're looking at the seven demands, you know, that's one of them. And, you know, you're going to have to, but, but you're going to have to figure out how, how do you, how do you convey the meaning of that to see what the response is? Mayor, um, can I just, I know we talked about this, but can I just share with the group what um, the staff thought was on the participatory budget piece? Sure. Um, we thought that it might be useful um, because I think there's, there's very, there's, 
a ton of variations in how you can do participatory budgeting um, that maybe we dedicate a portion of the September Budget and Finance Committee meeting to uh, just pull, uh, staff can pull some, uh, I know Mary uh, Thomas, uh, Jill of all trades, uh, was also chair of Oakland's Participatory Budget Committee for a number of years, um, and so has some unique experience that she can bring to the conversation and share uh, different models that different cities could use. And I think that would be a good uh, discussion because I think there is value in having, um, you know, uh, some sort of participatory process. We have the Community Services Commission process is sort of a, a, a toe, a small toe dip into participatory budgeting. But I think just getting some more background on the different models that are out there and. So we thought we could bring that in September for the committee to to talk about that and to, to hear more about that. Right, right. And I guess um, just, you know, I know that do, doing a headquarters building or not is a question is, um, you know, I've we've been I've got an email the other day. So I mean, how could you not build a new pre police headquarters <laughs> building? Well, when we don't have one hundred million dollars or whatever it's going to cost. But um, but um uh, you know, so you know, thoughts about that particular issue because that's a big issue for us as a city, and 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 around that, well, what about the opposite of building one new big police headquarters? Is what it would people want to see po the police department spread more around to town or diversified in some way? Um, and then, um, you know, do they have they ever viewed body ca body camera footage of an incident, and do they want to do that, or you know, something along those lines of what their, you know, what their reaction or what their experience has been, is, is, and even looking at the body camera footage that is um, has been made available on our website in some of in some of the incidents that we've had. Um, so I think that. Um, Oh, and then surveillance equipment was also mentioned in the uh, one of the seven demands, and that I mean, I you know my my response to that is well, exactly what are you talking about? So, and you know, I'm I'm not saying that, but you know, I'd like to know what the range of what they're talking about, and does it include body cameras? You know, do they not want us to have because body cameras are surveillance in a way, um, and um, and also our program that we have where people can register who have cameras. Do they want us not to have cameras in the city? I mean, I don't know that you can do that. You can tell a homeowner you can't have one, but then we often ask to see it in, in terms, in cases of an incident. And we have a special program where people can register um, there, you know, to, to let us know they have a camera. So if something happens in that vicinity, we can check with them. So um, that kind, I mean, you know, just what the, what the depth, I'm not quite understanding from the seven demands what the the uh, breadth of that request is, but surveillance really covers a whole of a lot of territory. So, all right, well, those are my comments. Um, could, could I add as well? Sure, go uh, ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I, considering we've had a couple different conversations about this, I, I just wanna be very clear. Um, when we talk about police involvement um, in, in any of this, one, it, it should be very much separated from the regular community, if you will, um, the non-uniform community. Um, because I know even in sanctuary status, we, we had conversations where, you know, police were there fully uniformed gear, and obviously that triggered people and stuff like that. And then comments were made talking about bringing ICE agents and having a conversation and so forth. And even those well-intentioned in the sense of, you know, just thinking, you know, two opposites can come and communicate with each other. Obviously, that's not how it was perceived. Um, so I, I want to be very clear on that um, in, in all of our meetings. And, and I understand that sometimes we do have officers, but um, I, I don't think it's appropriate necessarily for this particular type of conversation. Um, as far as uh, training, I specifically am very interested in the training. I personally don't think post is adequate enough. Um, oftentimes they ask you to do a certain type of training once every five years. And sometimes it's only like an hour, two hours, five hours, max eight hours um, to like once in five years. Right. Um, I'll be honest with you. I don't remember anything from five years ago. So um, it's, it's, it's difficult to say that, you know, training is sufficient just on the post uh, mandated requirements. So I would like to analyze what, what is actually happening within our department. And one of the goals with our new chief 
um, was very much to uh, take a look inside, see see what's going on, things like that. Um, and I, I really genuinely don't want a spiel. Um, I, I know that it, the community has talked about the HUSD presentation and, you know, some will say the tokenizing of certain members of color in the police department to, you know, um, speak very positively about their police experience. Um, and I'm sure that that's the case for that individual. However, um, this is kind of not a dog and pony show at this point, right? Uh, we want to get to the meat of it and we, we just want to start from scratch what's going on. So, um, I, I do want us to kind of focus on that, but with, with our, our chief, and I know that he worked on mental health. I know when I met with him last year around this time, in fact, like I think September, uh, right, right before he started, um, we did talk about just data when chief Kohler was here, we had a presentation in March or May where he went over some of the stats and kind of like the annual review of the police department. This year, we did not have that. And granted, COVID hit, so it kind of probably hit the time frame. Um, but at the same time, I, I know with our chief coming from San Francisco, uh, a bigger city, a little bit more mature in, in some of their processes and, and technologies and, you know, analysis is, um, I was expecting a little bit more of that this year, and I'm still hoping to see it because I do want to know, I remember asking Chief Kohler in particular the question, what is your response time from when you get a call to when you arrive on scene? And he clearly stated he did not have that answer, um, which was a shock because if you ask the fire department, when you get a call to when you arrive on scene, how long does it take? I want to say, and they will get upset if I say something wrong, but I think six minutes um, or give or take. Um, so I, I would like some of those stats. And I know our chief, um, definitely one of the first things he said to me was that he will be working on that. Um, so, but I also want to talk about the equity of service from the police throughout the city. So, um, I believe in our interviews last night, um, uh, Mr. Zachariah Okinda, who serves on the community advisory panel for, um, the chief, uh, stated that when he rides his bike around a street, it's not, um, the nicest part. And I'll be honest, I live there, so I know it's not the nicest part and we don't get the attention that we deserve. Um, so I just want to see in all of our services, whether it's maintenance, whether it's police, whether it's fire, so forth, um, that we are focused on the entire city, not in pockets of the city and so forth, the way that many people have accused, um, you know, the city and so forth. Um, so I, I do want... Can I just respond on, I wanted to, I know we did send a matrix of the training requirements for the, for our police department compared to the post standards. So I'm happy to send that again to the council. Cause I know we did, I'm sorry, did provide that information to the council. Uh, oh, I think it was probably last year. So I think you know, sending, sending that again in the context of this discussion might be helpful information uh, for everyone to have. So I'm happy to do that again. And it might be beneficial for, for the public as well, because I, I know that half the conversation is there. Um, so I know we have, you know, I ask for stuff and, you know, everybody else asks for stuff. One of the reasons why I want to talk about training and why training is so important is that, um, uh, the Insider just released an article, if anybody's um, going to take a note on this, called One of America's Most Popular Police Trainers is Teaching Officers How to Kill. Um, and granted, obviously, sensationalized um, title, but um, the training actually went in depth and the article went in depth. And 30 Hayward PD officers took this training in 2012 and 2013. Now, this predates many of us, but um, that is of concern. And there are sites that, um, you know, with all the hacking and so forth, um, uh, there is a list of 30 officers that I have um, that took this training. Um, so that is of concern. I'm happy to share that as well. Um, so there, I, I do want to say that I, I definitely want to, let's say, if we do have anything that is of question within our, our department and whether it's training or a, as we do a full analysis, is that we correct these things, right? So nobody's perfect. I know one of our... Um, uh, officers asked me point blank uh, in the last two months, um, do you think there's anything wrong with our department? Honest question. And, um, you know, I, I, I appreciate the question, but I, I also responded stating that um, if you think that 
anything's perfect, that's that's the problem right there, right? Um, because we have to continually improve, right? Um, so so even with our training and uh, look inwards, I definitely know and hope that our, our chief can, can um, kind of focus on that. Um, as far as surveillance, I, I know I've asked in every meeting we've talked about police, um, the email that that both council member mendel and i sent regarding surveillance and granted that only covered a small percentage of it i definitely want to have that at the forefront of the the conversation as well because it does address the demands um it was sent in february um we, we so i just had a meeting about it today so um it is the the policy document regarding um policy guidance around use of surveillance technology in the city so yeah, and and to Mayor, to your point, um, I think it's more in for me. One, it's sharing the data, and two, it's uh, it's how much surveillance do we really want to be big brother, if you will. Um, well, I, I agree with you that uh, you know that's an important area. We're talking about the survey today, though. We're not talking, and I think that you know before we make sweeping. I mean, I know we all have our opinions <laughs> about you know changes that may need to occur or that we think should occur in the department, but our focus today is on getting the communities. 100%. Input into and, that before, and, and, I think and that I, will help us form our responses too. But yes, it, it does. I, you know, it is easy to get off tr off to off the the topic of today and onto the the general, the bigger topic, which yeah. you know. And I, I certainly agree with you completely about data and that we need to be getting that. that that's a big element of what we're going to want to look at going forward. What and, and kind this, of data and are, are we getting? How often? in what manner is data being put out by yeah. our and, and, and I, I will say that this does uh, pertain to the sur survey because um, with the demands and everything else that has been included in this um, agenda item and, and the letters, uh, primarily when we talk about surveillance and, and their their requests for surveillance, um, you know, this does partake into that. And I, I do want to know what the public considers because sometimes um, over information overload is not a, a positive either. Um, and then as far as our critical incident updates, and I know that we have the website that we're trying to um, to kind of stand up so people are well aware of the process. Um, I know that we are going to update that. I, I, I don't know when that will be. So, so I guess a timeline of that. Um, I know that you guys had it in your last staff report as to um, kind of the focus of what you guys will include in that. Um, so there's two different. So there's two different. There's the critical incident page, and then we're creating a web portal, yes. which will be different. Which will have sort of a compendium of a variety of different things around this topic, including the ability for folks to sign up for an email distribution list and, and get, you know, the per the comments we heard from the council. Um, so that will be a separate page and should be up live shortly in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. And, and I, I definitely just wanted to highlight the critical incident page because it has not been updated. Um, so I, I just took a look at that, like I want to say yesterday. So um, I know we were going to update it with a couple items. Um, yes. Yeah, that should be. Um, should be updated by early next week, hopefully. Perfect. And then, as, as far as um, the 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 some of the questions, I, I do want to say that I I trust that we will not have leading questions as well. Um, I, I know that you know obviously researchers are going to be very much focused on that. Um, even if we had some open ended text, right, where it's not just a black and white, you know, check a multiple choice A, B, or C. Um, but some open text would be interesting to see what, and it could be a paragraph, no character limit, um, because some sometimes people will say, you know, the service was good, but my real problem was X, Y, and Z because I did not feel heard on X, Y, or Z, something like that, right? Um, so I would like some consideration in that, um, and and overall. Uh, you know, I, I, I know that this is a heavy, heavy bearing, so I, I do appreciate everybody's patience, um, including the communities. Um, and Mayor, I'm, I'm sure you weren't uh, too happy with, you know, some folks in front of your home. Um, so that was a little out what? of the norm yesterday when they visited you or yesterday or Monday or whenever they visited you. Um, some folks came by your home. We saw the videos on social media. So, um, yeah, I, I just want people to be a little patient. Um, and uh, I know staff is working on this and, you know, how we do this during COVID and the survey and, and things like that. But will when we get the questions, can we share it with the public as well? 
so I mean, I think we can we can probably figure out some way to do that. I mean, one of the things we don't want to do is I, I think in some surveys we're we're careful to not taint the results by sending out the the questions. I don't know, Dave, what your uh, uh, maybe 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 my question is more in the sense of um, you know the handful of people that if we were to select um, you know that can that is from the community. Um, that, that I mean, I think the, the intent was to share the questionnaire with some of the leaders of the community coalition to get their thoughts on it before we send it out, like we we did before we came to council with the uh, community engagement plan. So, um, you know, I think if that's if that's your interest in you know making sure we reach out to some of those key stakeholders, we're happy to do that. And if you were to do that again uh, with the questions, um, can we get a um, meeting record as to um, per question, some of the concerns around this was X, Y, or Z. Um, so, for example, if there was a question about mental health and the question was, you know, I don't know anything about it. Um, but um, if if somebody said, I, I am concerned about this question because, you know, they're stating mental health as a problem or, or whatever the case is, right? Um, if we can get some kind of, you know, the feedback response per question. We can we can take notes during the meeting and provide that to the council if you would like us to do that. Okay. I had one um, that prompted me to um, think uh, the the idea about um, including a uh, you know like your comments type your comments here right um, or you know at the end or um, but um, you know. It was, it, you know, you, you run the you run the risk of either being too short and people are like stopping in the middle of a word and oh, it won't let me type anymore, or you just don't you just don't want to ne necessarily open. We get some really weird letters sometimes, <laughs> and, you, know, you, you don't want to just. Um, so I don't know how you do that, but one of the things I thought of as I was thinking, I think that that is a good idea to include something like that, but maybe also a um, would you like to have uh, someone follow up with you regarding whatever it is on that's on your mind and talk in more in depth about this particular issue that you're you're wanting to tell us about. Yeah, I think that's good too. Yeah, I mean I think both both yeah. can be done but but uh you know there's going to be a finite it's going to be finite what they can type and some people that will be fine others it won't be but you know but if you add also would you like somebody to call you and follow up about if they really want to go on about some you know i realize that subjects some of us to some interesting <laughs> conversations but we all do have them and you know i mean and, and i think that's a part of what we need to understand if we're understanding um so I guess I want to go back to also the police, um, you know, how we're going to actually survey the police and whether, we, uh, just to make sure that people, we have had some challenging, um, you know, situations in our police department over the last 15 years, 16 years that I've been on council, <laughs> probably before that too, but there, you know, there've been a couple major um traumas that the police department has gone through um that's it's been several years but um since but uh you know just uh just to really get an idea of what people in the department really you know feel about what's happening there and you know especially including how long have you been with the department and yeah. you know kind of you know all right. With that, unless there's anything else, can we move on? Uh, um, I, I do have one one more of a question, I guess, for, for our city manager. Um, mm -hmm. Our uh, community advisory panel, I, I know that several members of the council, um, you know, kind of chimed in whether or not, one, it's going to be public, and two, uh, the Brown Act slash Robert rules. Um, uh, what did you take on it, and are we going to make any changes? I think we'll come back and talk to the council about that when we bring the issue back this fall. Um, I, you know, I think there was there was some intention behind not having it be a Brown Act committee. It gives it more flexibility to do some things, but um, you know, I think that's obviously something that we can talk further about with the council. Can I sneak in and when you get a second, can I sneak in on that point? 
Uh, yes, sure. Uh, uh, Chief, I think I hear that voice, Chief. You, you, you do. And uh, just real fast, uh, um, um, Councilmember Wahab talks about the uh, vast experience in San Francisco, and there was there was a lot of experience in San Francisco. We had many com um, community advisory panels, African American community advisory panel, um, um, Latino advisory, gay and lesbian. We had a bunch. And one of the things we did was so people could speak freely was um, it wasn't open to the public because there were sensitive items specific to those particular communities discussed. Um, I, you know, and it was it was done that way for a reason is because folks came in there and they bared their soul and talked about some things that, quite frankly, they didn't want out in the public sphere. And we also, as a police department, um, gave them kind of some of the inside playbook that not was not necessarily meant for uh, public dissemination. And so it, it made the information flow a lot better. It made it cleaner, it made it easier. And so that's why we did that. And, um, you know, I had my hand up earlier and I just wanted to address some of the things you're talking about. Post has their requirements and the Hayward Police Department is generally exceeding all those time restraints you're talking about um, uh, by years, if, if you're talking about five years. That's the other thing I wanted to talk about. And the other thing is talking about San Francisco, the chief was just uh, on a long interview on uh, KTVU talking about um, coming up with this innovative idea that if you pull your gun out, not use it or point it at anybody, but just pulling it out, you have to write an explanation. And it's a, it's a, it's a show of force and it's documented. Haywood has been doing that since 2017. The danger associated with the path we're currently on is, quite frankly, the city council members are ignorant of what, the, what their department is doing. I brought this up at another meeting. Most have not been at our facility in well over a year, physically. It's four minutes from City Hall. And I think this is the time and the place where we do need to educate folks. And you're talking about the time to respond to scenes and what Garrett Contreras uh, gave you and everything. That's cool, but his dispatch is our dispatch. Um, our dispatchers all work in the same facility for police and fire, so I can get you those numbers if you need them. There's a lot of information that's available at the Hayward Police Department. The problem is, until George Floyd, there was a lot of folks that were not interested, just kind of like community members not interested in the budget until George Floyd, and suddenly there's discussion about the police department. The other concern I just want to put on everybody's radar, we're reading and discussing a lot of the Hayward Collective and other folks' demands. There's some demands from people that do not want to defund the police department that I'm sure the city council has received by now. Um, I've been forwarded most of those demands as well. I've not heard those discussed one time. And that's of concern for me as the police chief in, in, in this city. So there's also another issue. The biggest disparity is the disparity of murder. We've had 10 homicides in the last eight months, four African-American males, five Latinx people, one female and one white male. And so I think the greatest disparity is having your life taken from you. There is no probation or parole from that. So um, I'd be happy to have this conversation with the city council, but I also want to make sure that we understand the reason we want somebody outside for this survey is right now things are white hot and we need somebody that's kind of dispassionate about it to come in and just talk about the raw numbers. The questions we all come up with, we can talk to as many different stakeholders as possible, come up with the questions, but the raw scientific data, we should have the hell. And the other piece is you talked about the Hayward police officer that attended that training. The controversial piece about that training, uh, council member Wahab, is the fact the guy that put that was one of the participants in that particular training is a is a expert witness for police departments, and they talk about his testimony. I get what you're saying, but that's post certified training by PhDs, as you've mentioned earlier, as folks that we need to talk about and consider as academics. Those are folks that did that training, and the fact that he's testified for police departments is what made him controversial. We look at our training and constantly reevaluate it. The rest of the nation is trying to catch up with the Hayward Police Department because they are CLIA certified, which less than 1% of the 18,000 law enforcement in this nation are. So when we look at some of the innovative cutting edge things that New York, Chicago, Philly, and other people are doing right now, they're playing catch up, quite frankly, with the Hayward Police Department. And my old department in San Francisco is evidenced by that, that press conference on, on Saturday or Sunday, I forget which day it was. They're talking about doing something we've been doing since 2017 in the city. So there's a lot of shining things that this department has been doing, and you're absolutely right, Commissioner, uh, Council Member Waha. There, there is no perfect department on the planet. It's it, there are people that work here, and by our very nature, we're all flawed. So I'm just throwing these things out there as a consideration that before we start making public comments, that we that you, I invite you 
all of you to come in and look so, so at sit down with our folks. Okay. Yeah, um, I, but I do think we're, what we're asking for is data, which we haven't really gotten for a long time. And I know that, you know, I mean, it's been a tough year and we've got a lot of other things on our plate right now. But um, I, well, I do well, think that's something well, we want to see so, more of coming out on a more regular basis than it has been in the last few years. Um, so, but so um, I'd like to ask um, something. Um, primarily in our last meeting, Chief, uh, you spoke as well um, today. You know, I'm, I'm hearing uh, something kind of down the similar path uh, of what was said on July 21st meeting. I, I will have to respectfully push back on a couple of things. Uh, number one, this council is a policymaking body. We are responsible for the different departments, and um, if we ask for uh, additional data that is within our accountability and responsibility uh, purview. Um, the people have have elected us to make sure that we are servicing them and servicing them well. I understand that we have had, again, hundreds upon hundreds of emails uh, regarding defunding the police and. I will state that, you know, I've heard the comments that they're not from here or so forth. Many of them have put their address and their phone uh, number. And if you respond to them, they will state that where they live. Um, I will say that, you know, democracy is a participation game. And so we have also received uh, a roughly about a dozen or so uh, um, anti-defund the police. Now, I, I'm not necessarily um, interested... Uh, maybe maybe to you, Mayor. Um, I haven't received all of them. Um, but I, I will say that, you know, my concern is more, let us take a raw look at this particular department that have, has historically, um, in, in many cities, in many jurisdictions and so forth, uh, public safety was never really looked at with, um, you know, controls or reining in anything uh, significantly. And I understand the training and so forth that you've even mentioned as as being above and beyond, if you will. Um, and it, it started roughly in 2017. Now, that's roughly three years ago. So I do believe that we have a lot of work to do. I don't want to debate the merits of who is speaking, who is not speaking, um, uh, the quality of our police department and, and police officers. I know that everyone is hardworking, um, I, but at the same time, um, I think our focus should be how can we improve where are the areas that we can um, understand, you know, what we are doing and what is the direction we want to go into. So I, I will leave it at that. And, yeah, and I, I, do, I will say I think that that is, you know, that that is what we are aiming to have is that kind of discussion. That is not what we're supposed to be having right here at this meeting. <laughs> and I really I'm sorry, but I just really want to get us back to focus on the. And I do think we've given a lot. I hope that we've given a lot of good input for this. I'm, I'll ask. Um, Mr. I have forgotten your name already, and I'm not seeing it on my screen, but <laughs> <laughs> survey person. Uh, <laughs> Mayor Halliday, can I can I can I say one last thing so I can close out the uh, my present my my uh, my commentary on this? And this is Chief Chaplain again, and uh, and I'll shut up very very quickly. <laughs> very quickly. No, I, I get what you're saying, uh, Councilmember Wahab, but those are form letters you're talking about. And that's what's bringing the ire of the department. Some of the folks that sent those letters to you, because I was CC'd on all of them, every single one of them, they forgot to remove, insert your name here and things yeah, of that nature. That's true. So yeah. to be fair, to be fair <laughs> to, to the police department, it's not fair to get blitz to get blitzkrieged by a form letter that reads exactly the same from everyone. The letters that we got from the public pro police are all different. They're not Chief, four Chief, letters. Chief, okay, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to cut this off now. We are not going to have this debate, please, uh, so, right so, now. So I just want to state that um, that that is you know similar to what we've received when we talk about rental issues. Um, these template emails are kind of this the status quo now. So I get what you're saying, and I do agree that you know I would like a little bit more individual. Um, I, individualization of these emails, but um, that is what it is. Um, but the goal here is still the same. So let's let's focus on these questions. It is, it is it, and we, this is a step toward the goal, getting the survey. This is only a piece. I think maybe even the more important piece is the community conversations that we're gonna try to have. And um, 
you know, we'll move on from there. Um, but so, I, so again, I want to ask um, our surveyor: uh, um, Do you um, is there? Do you have any questions of us after hearing all that? Or do you no, feel that you got uh, good input from us? I got good input. This is a very helpful starting point, and and we will take this all into account as we begin work on designing the survey. All right. And so I'm going to ask that we move on because, you know, I, I don't want to get into that full debate. We are going to have that conversation. And, you know, and we that's but that's a conversation we need to be having now with the people who live here in a lot of different ways. So um, I think that will be happening. All right. So with that, we're going to move on to are there any future agenda items? I think we have the September participatory, participatory. budgeting discussion. Uh, Dustin, I think you're still on. Um, are there any other uh, topics for September. Uh, at this point, that's all. Um, that doesn't mean that that won't change between now and then. Like, uh, like it, it certainly could, um, especially if we get more information on any stimulus funding that may come. Um, unfortunately, I did read that there was nothing included in the Senate's plan for uh, cities, um, but certainly we hope that that will change between now and uh, now and the time that that's passed. So, well, I perhaps just an item on any. Um, anything you can tell us about how revenues are looking and in, in light of COVID and the situation we're in. I think we ought to have that sort of standing right now. Any new developments or, or you know, surprises that are happening or, you know, in terms of revenue, good or bad, hopefully good. I will but. try to keep them all good, but I okay. uh, can't keep <laughs> You need to hear the other two. Sarah, did you have? Yeah, just, um, yeah, to the point, sort of the standing budget item on budget updates something to that effect so we get a sense of, you know, how is, where's the revenue, you know, to close to projections, where are the expenses um, in comparison to projections, et cetera. And I think that, yeah, it gives us room to talk about COVID or changes or whatever, but it seems like that should be the standing item or a standing item on any agendas for, you know, ever. <laughs> but anyway, for this year. Okay. Sense. Aisha? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I personally, I, I do agree with uh, my, my two colleagues that that requested the COVID be a standing item. Obviously, I think you've done that um, in the last couple uh, meetings overall. Um, but one of the things I definitely do want to see is um, as as Google has announced that they're going to be shelter in place till 2021 of, you know, next year of some time, uh, July, I want to say, um, many other organizations and things like that, we're going to take a harder hit than I think we all anticipated and expected. Um, I would like to see tier two or phase two of what else we could potentially be doing. And I know that you're probably already doing it, but I would like to see um, what are the other considerations, especially as we move into October, our unions have also requested that, you know, once they see the economic, um, <clears throat> you know, position that we're going to be in. Um, so I would like us to kind of uh, see where we're going to go with that as well. So if, if we can get an update around that. Yeah, I think okay. we actually, yeah, the, yeah, and we can talk a little bit more about that in uh, upcoming meetings. But yeah, the executive team, we actually had a conversation today about what should be the time frame for reopening and what does that look like and how are we going to start to reconfigure city services in a more uh, sort of long term. We've been sort of band-aiding um, work from home for people. And now it's like, okay, so now we're going to be in this for a longer period of time. So maybe we should actually be more thoughtful about how we're really changing the services that we're providing and doing it in a more thoughtful way. So. Well, and I will say, I, I do think that the staff has kept up in a valiant way, working from home with responding to things, but it's, it, you know, we all, we all know that that is, um, it's a it wears on if you're trying to do a job to to have to any job our job is more difficult because we have to meet in this way and it's just not the same but yeah so i don't know that that that's uh, some of that is really even beyond the scope of the budget um of the budget committee i want to I stick to you know what's what the budgetary issues are here but i think that's a larger conversation that we need to have as a council too so um all right anything else aisha or sarah with that any announcements uh from staff or committee members hearing uh, that uh, i 
I understand there was a issue or a glitch with the YouTube live audio. So hopefully, um, uh, I, I think the meeting is being it was broadcast. I hope it's being recorded. So hopefully, it'll the recording will be posted later and on the website so folks can watch it if if it's available. But I just I, I apologize for that. I'm not sure what happened with the YouTube. YouTube. Yeah, we we, bro we broadcast the meeting via YouTube this evening. And uh, oh, I, I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, so it's been, it was on KHRT and on YouTube this this evening. Okay. Uh, they 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 also stated um, that there was no call in number in our staff report. I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, I, I, I yeah, this there we do not we have not taken public comments for committee meetings via via call in. Um, so n none of the committee meetings have been taken, taking verbal public comments as just written, um, and that's in compliance with the emergency orders. So we, we are working to try and figure out how we do that moving forward with and broadening that to our committee meetings um, after the August recess. But it's um, there's some additional training and logistics that need to happen to make that happen. Okay. All right. So anyone else for the good of the? Okay. We are therefore we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.